My name is Steve Finkbeiner, and I come from the Gladstone Institutes and the University of California, San Francisco. What do you do, Steve? Uh, I'm a neurologist and also a neuroscientist, and a big focus of our research is to try to understand the mechanisms of neurodegeneration, and especially in ALS, and then based on what we find, to try to find therapies that might be useful in the clinic. What have you been working on, and what are you finding about the disease based on your research? Uh, well, one of the things we've done is to develop or invent a new technology that allows us to be able to uh, understand the mechanism or the cause of the disease better in single cells. It's called a, ro a robotic microscope. Yeah, and, uh, and then the other thing we've been working on is based on using that tool, we've found a pathway in cells that seems to be important for whether neurons can survive having some of these ALS-causing proteins in them, and it's called autophagy. Every cell has it, and it's a pathway that neurons use to normally uh, get rid of proteins that they don't want, uh, among other things. And what we've done is to find small molecules, things that could potentially be drugs, that stimulate that pathway in neurons. And what we found so far is that they seem to protect the neurons against at least one of the, or two of the ALS-causing proteins, TDP43 and another protein called FUS, or FUS. What other proteins are there? Uh, there's a protein called SOD1 that we know of that uh, can cause ALS, and there's just a newly described gene uh, that was described a couple weeks ago that has a horrible name, C9ORF72, uh, that may be cause as much genetic ALS as SOD1. And what we're hope hoping is that, although we still don't understand what causes most ALS, uh, that this pathway that we're triggering called autophagy might be useful even before we fully understand those causes, the causes of sporadic ALS. Would that be applicable, what you're studying to both sporadic and uh, genetic ALS? That's what we hope, uh, because we know in sporadic ALS we still see protein deposits, these abnormal inclusions that form in neurons, and what that tells us is that the neuron is struggling to deal with a protein f problem and what stimulating this pathway can do is we think boost the neurons ability to help get rid of proteins so that they don't deposit that way. Mm, okay so it has wide potentially. We think so yeah and we've already shown that stimulating this pathway can help in some other neurodegenerative diseases which is and, and one of the common features that these diseases have are these abnormal protein deposits that can form and so we're hopeful that it will not only work for the genetic uh, genetically caused ALS but maybe the sporadic too. Tell me about this robotic technology. Yeah so you know, the old-fashioned way to do microscopy is you sit down to the instrument and you look at your cells one at a time. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, limitations to that approach. It takes a lot of time. It takes the time of valuable scientists when they could be thinking about, you know, uh, deep, deeply thinking about problems. And the other thing is that you can only look at so many cells. And, uh, and what we wanted to develop was an approach that would free up the scientists' time, that would allow them to be able to look at these cells in an unbiased way. Uh, and so we invented a, what we call a robotic microscope where we've attached auto automated motors to every aspect of the microscope and a robotic arm that delivers cells to the, to the microscope. And then we wrote software programs that caused all of the pieces to work together. And then once the images are collected, to go into the images and actually find each neuron individually, give it something like a little social security number, and follow it over time. And what that's enabled us to do is to apply some of the same tools we use for clinical trials to our studies in cells in a dish. And so it's made it possible not only to use that and, and really uh, achieve a power that we've never been able to achieve before, partly because of the number of cells we can study, but partly because we can follow the whole lifetime of that cell. Uh, so that's made it possible to learn things we couldn't learn before. And then, likewise, we can take all that power and apply it to our efforts to try to find drugs uh, to, to, uh, to make things better. Uh, for these cells. What specifically do you think your research will lead to, like the end result? What do you, what do you hope it will lead to? Oh goodness, well I hope a clinical trial uh, for some of these small molecule therapeutics. Uh, the approach that we're taking is to try to, uh, you know, unfortunately it's difficult in academia to get the resources to really uh, develop drugs. Um, so we have to take our pre the precious resources we have and try to leverage them as much as we can and take our most promising idea as far forward as we can. That's been our strategy and then 
uh, we still depend a lot on drug companies as partners to eventually pay for clinical trials, but what we aim to do is to do everything we need to to be able to uh, show them that this particular idea has promise and, and that it really merits an investment by them to be able to take it forward to a clinical trial. So, you know, as a neurologist, you know, I really am trying to see if we can make a difference in the clinic. So what, what drugs might your research potentially lead to? Drugs that do A, B, C, or D, you know, why don't you describe it for us? Sure, yeah, so. Uh, and how, how far away do you think that might be? Yeah, so there's a drug, uh, well, our most advanced lead program in the translational center that I direct is one that targets neuroinflammation. So that's a complicated word, but uh, uh, all of us have an immune system that helps us do good things like fight off infection. But sometimes in neurodegenerative diseases, these systems get activated abnormally. And what we've found or the evidence so far seems to suggest that that abnormal activation plays a role in the progression of ALS and maybe make symptoms worse for people. And the interesting thing is that same abnormal neuroinflammation shows up in other diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and Huntington's. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we think that that might be a really interesting thing to try to intervene uh, for a variety of these disorders, including ALS. So there's an enzyme that, that has been discovered at the Translational Center and patented small molecules that we now inhibit that. We've shown that they work in a number of neurodegenerative diseases and now we have funding to take it all the way to do special studies that the FDA requires to make sure the compounds aren't toxic to people and it'll get us all the way to a phase one clinical trial and we're very close to partnering that program and probably have already with a drug company who would be willing to pay for it to go all the way through clinical trials. And then the next one after that is this program I talked about, autophagy, where we can uh, stimulate normal pathways in neurons that deal with proteins that aren't folding properly and clear them. We have uh, small molecules there. Some of them are already FDA approved and we know they get into the brain, so we're hopeful that uh, this strategy would be useful for treating neurologic disease and there were also a little bit earlier stage but we have um, we're in discussions with a number of companies to be able to move those uh, forward as well and then we have a, probably 10 other programs uh, at earlier stages still and sort of again our strategy is as we find partners to move these out the resources that we free up will allocate to some of the earlier programs to move those toward the clinic. Exciting. Yeah. So multifaceted really the approach yeah, that you're taking. Yeah essentially is kind of what we're thinking you know I you know, we don't know what the, what the treatment's going to look like for these diseases, but we imagine that it may take more than one drug to really do, do it really well. Perhaps it'll be a little, a little like cancer in that regard, where oftentimes it takes a, a couple drugs to really have a, a, a huge impact on the disease. And so we want to make sure that we have a lot of ideas coming through so that uh, uh, if one's successful, maybe a second one will make it even better. Uh, or if one fails, we've got something, a backup program. So Steve, uh, put it in layman's terms for us now, just kind of an umbrella picture of what a summit like this accomplishment, uh, accomplishes and where we can um, hope to go from here. Uh, I think a summit like this accomplishes a couple of things. Uh, there's no substitute for putting people in the same room to discuss things. Uh, and one of the fundamental challenges, I think, in doing translational research like this, where we're trying to take basic discoveries in the lab and actually make a difference for patients, is it necessarily involves people with very different expertises. There are people who work, you know, biochemists who work on the nuts and bolts of a protein all the way to people uh, in the clinic actually treating patients. And a lot of times the language that people use to communicate those ideas are very different. So getting people face to face rather than reading papers is a much more effective way to transfer information from one to the other and back and forth. Uh, the other is I think uh, as people get to know each other and uh, and get excited about things, collaborations can emerge that might not have occurred to people, but that really come out through a dialogue. And so, I th again, I think it's very hard to do that in your office, reading a paper by yourself, uh, whereas I think a meeting like this can be very helpful. And sometimes it's not just a dialogue, it's a, a conversation with several people at once where you'd need to actually have three or four experts in the room and, and you really can't achieve that with anything except a summit like this. So I think that's been very helpful. It gets everyone excited, recharged, new ideas, maybe helps them even refocus some of their efforts so that uh, they're more productive. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, 
you know, it's great too to have contact with patients as well for, for some of the scientists who don't normally see patients to get them reminded of what it's all about and, and really, you know, pushing things forward.